Otherwise, guys, let's get the party started. Are you ready to welcome? The one and only Nathan. Nathan Riggs. So One Team Global is one of the only support organizations we have in network marketing on this kind of scale. And OTG supports you guys' business in a huge way. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah! And he's a founder and creator of that. On top of that, he's built an enormously big uh, organization with New Skin. And my favorite story is when he got started, his goal was to earn 100 thousand dollars in one month after one year so after one year in the business his goal was to earn one hundred thousand US dollars do you think he did it yeah. <laughs> he was very 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 close what was the number <laughs> 99, 6, 41, <laughs> So, to me, this is not only the biggest legend in new skin, but to me, in my eyes, he's the biggest legend in network marketing, okay? And one way we can see that is, has anybody heard of Eric Worre? Yeah, he interviews all the top network marketers. And he's done like hundreds and hundreds of videos. Guess who the most watched video is? Nathan Ricks. So we're not going to take any more of his time because you'd rather listen to him than us. But let's give a huge standing ovation for Nathan Ricks. So today what we're going to do is just talk about a couple of unique things. I want to spend about an hour and talk a little bit about the basics of, of becoming a millionaire in this company. Like what does it take to do that? I'll speak very directly. I hope I don't offend anybody, but I'm just going to tell you the way it is. That's my MO. Um, I don't beat around the bush very much. I'm a businessman, and when I got approached about New Skin, I simply wanted to understand how the business worked, okay? Frankly, I wasn't that into the products, to be honest, okay? For me, it was a vehicle that was going to take me from my current financial position to a place that I wanted to be. Now, I didn't have any way to compare whether the products were good or not, so I gave them to my wife. My wife was a clinic lady, right? And she said, these are way better. They're way better. 
And that was good enough for me on the products. I thought if they're good, they're that good, then you know, X percent of the population is gonna end up using these products. I just wanna make sure they're in my network so I get commissions on that consumption, right? So for me, it was purely a business proposition. And that's probably kind of skewed the way that I look at the business all the time, as I kind of always look at it as a business. So I hope to, today, this morning, while we're here together, that you'll kind of take my perspective. Maybe you're a completely product-oriented person, and there's nothing wrong with that, okay? That's perfectly great, all right? Maybe you'll actually pick up a little bit more about the business and how I look at it as a business. Because, you know, frankly, if I can't make a lot of money every month, I'm not that interested. No matter how great the products are, I'll be happy to use the products, but I'm not gonna put my time and effort and energy and my focus of my, my business life into something unless it really is fantastic. So I've said this many times before, all right? I think New Skin is the best business on the planet. I've got other businesses and they have their risk and their brain damage and the things that you don't have to have in New Skin. And with New Skin, you get this amazing business gives you huge upside potential, big time leverage, even global leverage with literally no risk. And that combination of massive potential with literally no risk is something you can't find any place else. Typically, when you get huge upside potential, there is huge risk attached to that. Huge leverage, huge risk, right? Not in this case. This is an anomaly as we look around the world, and that's why people that are really thinking about those parts of the equation eventually figure it out, they gravitate to this business, they understand what it is, what their objective is, what they need to do to create this ongoing, recurring income stream that can sustain them for the rest of their lives. And that's why we're here. New Scan, at its very core, is a vehicle. Okay, if you take the onion of new skin, you peel away all the layers of the onion, you get right down to the core of what this really is. It's a vehicle, right? It's a vehicle that allows us to accelerate and compress time. So instead of taking 40 years to try to accomplish something, we can compress that down to five years or 10 years maybe, and then we can be done. We don't have to worry about money the rest of our lives. That's what attracted me, you know? I mean, when my brother-in-law recruited me, those were the kind of concepts that caught my attention. You know, he said, you can go out and keep doing your real estate, but every year you're gonna start over. You know, January 1st, it goes back to zero, and you gotta pump up and, you know, see how you do that year, and then, you know, it goes to zero, and you pump up the next year. He said, this one's totally different. This one, you build it to a point, the next year you add on to where you were, you don't go to zero, you start where you're at, you build it again, start where you're at, you build it again, start where you're at, build it again. After a certain amount of time, there's enough volume, there's enough leadership that's been developed that you can end up having this recurring stream of income. And how do we do that? How do we create that volume? Okay, in this company, ladies and gentlemen, it's leadership development. It's creating executives. It's about being an executive factory. And what we do is we create these, this structure of executives and we hang the volume on the structure. That's how you do it. You gotta create the structure first and then you hang the volume on the structure, right? And that's what it takes to build a really substantial, significant organization. All right, so let's just back up. I wanna tell you a story really quick, okay? And the story starts with a three by five card, okay? Everybody knows what a three by five card is? Well, this was a little three inch by five inch card that was in my mother's recipe file, okay? When I was 14 years old, I don't know where I received this audio cassette tape from. Somehow, I don't know, somebody somewhere, somehow I got my hands on an audio cassette by a gentleman named Paul J. Meyer from the Success Motivation Institute in Waco, Texas. I'll never forget his voice. Waco, Texas. <laughs> okay, had that Texas drawl. And on this audio tape, which was about 30 minutes long, he talked about, for the first time in my life, setting goals, writing them down, reading them every day, focusing on your goals, and if you did that, you could accomplish anything. Now, I grew up in a house where my father worked for the government, my mother was a school teacher, so she kind of worked for the government too, all right? And we just didn't have much money. 
At least if my parents had any, we never knew it, right? Because I would say to my dad sometimes, hey, can we go to the movies? And my dad would say, ah, we can't do that. We don't have any money. And I said, well, can we go out to the restaurant, you know? We'd go once a year, like on Christmas. We'd go to a restaurant, and that was it, you know? And the rest of the time, I was like, we don't have any money. And if, heaven forbid, I said, well, can we go to Disneyland like our neighbors? He's like, oh, are you kidding? We don't have any money, okay? Eventually, I figured out we didn't have any money. <laughs> and something happened inside of me, you know, when I was this young teenager. And one time, I just said to myself, I don't want to ever tell my kids we don't have any money. You know, so it like triggered something in my brain, you know? So I think I was looking for an opportunity like New Skin. I think I was preconditioned because of this no money thing, my whole growing up life, but I was preconditioned to find a way. I had to find some way that I wasn't going to have to say that to my kids. And so, so that's kind of where this whole thing started, is I'm listening to this tape, and it's like magic. I'm thinking, really? Is that it? You just like think about what you want, you write it down, you read it every day, you go to work on it, and it's going to happen? Really? My parents have never said anything like this to me. I don't know about your house where you grew up or your parents talking about goal setting and doing goal setting sheets with you. Probably not. I mean, not my folks, you know. No one ever talked about it. And so it was like this whole new concept. And I, I started thinking, okay, well, I'm going to try it. And I remember grabbing this three by five recipe card out of my mother's recipe box. And I drew a line down the middle. And I wrote my two goals on both sides of these two columns, the top of the, the card. When I was 14, all I could think about was American football. That was all on my mind. I loved the Minnesota Vikings. I'd wear purple to school, you know? That was their color. I mean, I was just so into it, okay? It's probably like Manchester or something around here, okay? I mean, I was totally into it. And so all I could think about was like playing football, but I had a problem. I was about as tall as I am now, but I weighed 50 kilos. Okay? So I was really skinny, like 120 pounds. Really skinny. I was so skinny that when I walked to the supermarket, I had to jump on the mat to get the door to open. That's how skinny I was. <laughs> so, you know, I'm just sitting there going, I want to play football, and my dad is like, you know, he's smart, so he goes, you're an idiot, you're going to get killed, you know? You're like a stick, they'll break you in half. So I'm, I'm forbidding you to play. And so this goes on for like three years. Finally, he goes, look, when you get into high school, if you still want to play, then I'll, I'll consent that you can play then, okay? Well, I'm this skinny kid, and so I'm thinking, I, I mean, I need to figure out how to do this. So I get this card, and I write 120 pounds on the top of both columns. One column was bench press, how much weight I could lift, which wasn't much. And the other column was my body weight, which was about the same, right? And every time I would focus on these goals, I would just start to like, work out, I met these two guys at a youth recreation facility in my neighborhood where they get kids off the streets, and these guys taught me how to lift weights. They were like coaches, and they said, you gotta eat a lot. You gotta start eating a lot of food. Okay, fine, so I can get up for breakfast, tell my dad, Papa, I mean, more food, okay? I go to school, I buy two or three school lunches. I put those down, right? I go work out, then I go home, try to get all the food I can get, then I wait for my father to go into the living room and start reading the paper, and I sneak back into the kitchen, right? And I grab more food. So this house where we live, we have no money. We get one set of clothes for school in the fall when it's time to go back to school. We go to the store, we buy our clothes for going back to school, and heaven forbid, I grow out of my clothes. And that started to happen. So two or three months later, you know, my legs are starting to get bigger, my butt's getting bigger, you know, my chest is getting bigger. And my dad's like, okay, what are you, what are you doing? You know, because we're not buying any more clothes. You understand this? And I said, yeah, okay, fine. I don't care. You know, I got my goals written down, right? Every morning, I wake up. I've got this three-by-five card pasted on my dresser in my bedroom. Every day I wake up, I see the goals, okay? Once I'm at 130, I cross it out, I write 140. I cheat that, cross it out, write 150, 160, 170, 180, 190. I mean, I'm doing this for years, Okay. My friends or my coaches say, hey, it ain't happening fast enough. You need to start like drinking protein. You gotta get protein drinks, okay? You gotta keep eating everything you can eat at your house because you gotta get protein drinks too. Okay, fine. So I buy a blender and I put it in my coach's office. Because at this point, my father's taking the rationing my evening meal. 
My father's putting on my plate what he wants me to eat. There you go, son. Okay? And so I have to resort to these other tactics to get more calories and more protein, right? And so I hide this blender in my coach's office so my dad doesn't know about it. On the way to school on Monday mornings, I go to the supermarket, I buy two gallons of milk, I buy five dozen eggs, I've got my can of protein powder in my coach's office, I get there before school, I put in the milk, I put in six raw eggs, I put in two scoops of protein powder, blend that baby up, this thick yellow goo that just stunk, you know? <laughs> Hold my nose and just chug this thing out of the blender and try not to bark. Seriously, my stomach's revolting on it. Stay down there. Like that. I finally get my stomach settled down. I go to do my classes, two to three school lunches, go work out, back to the coach's office, milk, six more eggs, two scoops, hold my nose, keep it down, go home and play like I'm starving. Dad, come on. Let me have more food, right? Read the newspaper, back in the kitchen. Go get more food. At nine o'clock, I'm in bed. How come? Because they told me that's when you grow, between 9 and midnight. So I was never not in bed at 9 o'clock, right? <laughs> I had no social life. I didn't really care. I was all about football, lifting weights, and getting big, right? <laughs> These friends tell me you need more protein at night. I'm like, oh, brother, what am I going to do? My blenders and my coaches on this. <laughs> so I go to the supermarket. I buy these cases of tuna fish. I have a can opener that I've hidden in my dresser behind my 3 by 5 car. When my father's down reading the newspaper, I crank open a can of tuna fish, chicken of the sea. I drain the oil on the, the shingles outside my window. I warm it. I get rid of the oil. I snarf the, uh, the tuna fish. I have to learn to throw left-handed. I put the lid back in, and I dispose of the evidence in my neighbor's lilac bush. <laughs> True story. And that worked fantastic for several months until winter came and the leaves fell off the lilac bush. <laughs> I'm back in the yard raking leaves with my father in the fall. My dad goes, look at our neighbors, what a bunch of pigs. They threw all their cans in the bush, you know? <laughs> yeah, it must be. <laughs> and that's what's that oil spot outside your window. I'm sure right there. Don't know. That was my life, you know? I grew so fast during high school, my coach called me his plant. <laughs> growing, right? I put on 100 pounds in high school. So I totally transformed my body, right? Because I was focused on this goal. I learned at a really long, young age that if I wrote it down, I read it every day, and I took action, I focused on that goal every day, that I could do it. Don't you think that I learned that if I could change my body that dramatically, that I could do anything? Sure. I feel so grateful that I learned that lesson so early in my life. So I brought a few pictures just to show you what I used to look like. Wow. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> that's not my girlfriend. I couldn't get one at that point, right? So I was kind of a porker. Yeah, there you go. Check out that tie. <laughs> Now, I know that your tie is supposed to touch your belt. I know that, okay? My problem is my neck was like 20 inches. It didn't matter how long the tie was, you know? The stubs clear up here, and it's still not long enough. They called me No Neck Name. Just went from my ears to my shoulders. There was no neck. So, this was a great lesson. Okay? It was a fantastic lesson for me to learn. So I've used this my whole life, and probably not a surprise to you that my children all understand how to set goals. Because I've sat down with my kids every year in January and said, okay, what are you going to do in your life this year? And we've set goals in all these different areas, right? And I've continued to do that uh, throughout my life in my new skin business. When I started, uh, every year as life goes on, I decide what am I going to accomplish this year. And it's just amazing because if you don't do this, if you just kind of think about it, you think, yeah, I want to be a blue diamond, that ain't going to cut it. Okay, that doesn't work, guys. 
It's not specific. It's not written down. You're not reading it every day. You're not programming your subconscious mind so that becomes like your dominant thought, your dominant objective. Okay? And this is something that if you'll do this, it'll change your whole business. It'll change your life. It'll change every area of your life if you decide that you're going to do this. All right? So, you know, we talk about this a lot, but I find that very few people actually do it. Uh, I have my... My original goals from 2000 and, let's see, when was that? It was 1991. I have my original goals from 1991. They're here with me right now. They go everywhere with me. They're my little planner. And I set them in five areas. You know, I set them in spiritual. I set them in physical. I set them in financial. I set them in emotional, mental health, and social goals. Okay? Those are my five areas that I set them in. And I can go back right now and read out of this book, and you would say, are you kidding? The stuff I wrote down in 1991 seemed crazy. Every single one's happened. Every single one. I have a schedule, okay? Because I write them down. I read them, not those ones every day. I read those periodically, right? But I read my other goals consistently, my annual goals of what I'm trying to accomplish. So when I started New Skin, you can imagine that my why, was this, because I grew up in a house where they always said, we don't have any money, <laughs> okay? I just didn't want to worry about money. I was freaked out about money all the time. I remember when our first child was born, I was like, I was hyperventilating, you know? And it wasn't because I was, I was excited to have a baby, of course, but it was like, holy smokes, now there's like another human being that I'm responsible for, <laughs> you know? I've got to make this happen. And I was just so freaked out all the time about money, and I would go to restaurants and I'd be looking at the menu, go, okay, I can't afford that, I can't order that, I gotta get to this side of the menu over here, I'd go into like a clothing store, no, I can't do that, you know, I gotta get a deal of some kind, you know, it's a bad, it's a bad attitude to have, likely, but that was the way I was thinking all the time. Jeff Mack, my good friend, grew up in the same kind of circumstances, like, no money, you know, and Jeff Mack and I would go to bark to buffets and we would just crush the buffet. We think we gotta get our money's worth out of this buffet. It's a bad thing. You start to put on a lot of weight. And so that's a bad attitude, right? But that's the way I was always thinking. And so I just didn't want to have to worry about money. For some people, you know, they want to post a picture of a big car. There's nothing wrong with that, you know. They want to post a picture of this nice estate, and it's it's wonderful to have great properties and so forth. For me, it really wasn't any of those things. For me, I just didn't want to worry about money anymore. I just wanted to have consistent cash in my bank all the time so I didn't have to worry. I could just order what I wanted on the menu, you know? And so that was my driving force. That was my motivation. Didn't want any debt, didn't want any mortgages, didn't want any payments on cars, on credit cards, nothing. I just wanted to be free, you know? And so that was my driving force. Now, Rick mentioned this just a moment ago in the introduction, but this is my actual goal sheet that I wrote down the day I started New Skin. Okay, this is back on June 15th of 1989. So just in a couple of weeks, I'm going to celebrate my 27th anniversary in New Skin, which is pretty amazing. And you can kind of see that that's what I did right down. Make 100000 per month by building a large New Skin downline in one year. I didn't even know what I was writing down, right? The only reason I wrote that down is my brother-in-law said he was going to make 100000 a month. <laughs> True story. I had no comprehension about what that even meant. Like, how big of a team would I have to build to make that happen? I just thought, you know what? If he's going to do it, i got to do it. I can't let him beat me. I'm competitive. And so I'm going to write down the same thing, and I did. Okay, and as Rick mentioned, I came pretty close. Okay, I missed the goal, but I came pretty close. So here's what I get. What's my benefit from achieving this goal? I will have complete financial peace of mind. This is my elimination of financial stress. That was my driver, right? That was my why. It's like, I, had, I gotta solve this. If I got this chance that I can compress time in a five year period, I can solve this for the rest of my life? It's a huge motivator for me, right? That's why I did that. Number two, I will have the time freedom to be with my family and do what I want to do when I want to do it. Now, for a lot of you, that's got to be a motivator, you know? How many of you are tired of other people controlling your schedule, controlling your time, telling you when to be someplace, when you can take a break, when you go on vacation, when you, you know, when you go home, those kind of things, okay? That's not 
a good existence. You know, it's just a job. A job is a job is a job, okay? They're only gonna pay you enough to keep you coming back. They will never pay you enough to set you free. They don't have to. There's other people that are willing to do your job for about what you earn today if you don't want to do it anymore. There's plenty of people in line, okay? So you have no leverage on your boss. You can't demand five times more salary because other people will replace you. That's just the market, okay? The only way we get ahead is we have to find our own thing. We got to do our own business of some kind, right? And when you analyze all the kinds of businesses and you really look at it clearly, that's what I said a minute ago, I think you'll come back to the fact this is the best one you will ever see. Okay, because you give this with no risk, right? Every other business, lots more risk. So that is what is so key, all right? So this has been an amazing thing. Some of you know that I'm a pilot. I love to fly airplanes, okay? I've been working on this for more than 10 years since I sat in the back of the plane the whole time I was building my new skin business all over the world. And I just thought, this is ridiculous. I'm not a backseat guy. I'm a front seat guy. I should be flying this thing, okay? And so I decided to do it. And I found a guy that would just fly around to my new skin meetings with me, and he was an instructor. I just hired him and said, you're not going to teach any other students. You're just going to teach me. I'm hiring you. You're going on all these trips with me. And of course, he became one of my customers on my back and everything. <laughs> <laughs> and so we started just doing that. And otherwise, I couldn't have done it, you know, with my schedule, unless I just was able to hire this guy to go with me. And so I bought this airplane. And then every year they come up and upgrade, and I'm a sucker, so every year I buy a new airplane, and I just keep upgrading. When I bought my fifth airplane from the same company after five years, they brought the whole factory workers in and thought, this guy's an idiot, to buy five of these in a row, you know? And they gave me a big award for being the guy who bought the most airplanes in the back. Right? Well, then I said, I want to fly jets. Well, that's a whole different world. When you get into jets, I mean, things just happen a lot faster, right? And so you got to really be on your game. It's a whole different kind of process. And so I went through all those steps, you know, and finally I got my ATP, my airline transport rating license last year. So I could go fly for British Airways if I wanted to, right? But of course I wouldn't do that. They don't pay enough, right? So, <laughs> so that's what uh, that's what I decided to do. This is one of the things that makes you free. So in my life, it's really simple. I can say to my wife, let's go down to our beach house, you know, let's just jump in the plane, just get online, follow a flight plan with the FAA. We drive to the airport, you know, they know who we are, they just open the gate, we drive right out to the plane, they've got it waiting, they've already put the fuel on, everything's ready to go, we just get out of our car, the valet takes our car away, our bags go on the plane, we fire up the engines, we land down in California at our beach house, and uh, you know, we get Uber, just Uber over, it's really simple, right? <laughs> and uh, there we are. I mean, it's like an hour and a half. It's incredible, you know? I wouldn't even be through security. The plane would be closing the door by the time I land if it was a commercial flight, right? And so it's crazy. I don't have my plane here in Europe and it's driving me nuts. I'm like thinking, I need me in Stockholm like this afternoon, you know? And how am I gonna make that happen? It's just pure luck I can find the flight. Hopefully it doesn't screw up, right? <laughs> then I actually get there. Talk about freedom. Talk about the ability to control your life and your time, right? You just say, okay, let's just go here, let's just go there. It's, it's incredible. I mean, it's incredible, okay? So, a lot of fun to do that. Number three, I can grow equity positions in my business empire much more rapidly. Well, I didn't have any business empire at the time. I wanted one, but I didn't have one yet. And I thought to myself, well, new skin will be my cash cow. That's what will generate the cash so that I can actually buy these properties. You see, I, I came from real estate into new skin. I was a broker, and I would broker other people's properties, whether I'd sell them or lease them for people, and I was getting real estate commissions in doing so, right? And I always said to myself, this kind of stinks. I actually wish I owned these properties instead of just brokering these properties, right? And so it was always in the back of my mind that someday I just want to make sure I've got properties like this. And New Skin was kind of when I began, it was like a means to an end. There's probably some of you in this room today that are here and you're thinking, you know, I mean, maybe this isn't my first choice, but I get it. I see that I can leverage myself. I see that I can create this recurring stream of money. So I'm going to actually do this. I'll actually work really hard and I'll build this business because I have another objective. I've got another goal. I've got something else I want to do with all that money. Okay? And some of you, that may be your motivator. 
For me, it kind of was. I thought, you know, I'm just going to crank this thing out for five years. I'll be done. There'll be this residual stream, and I'll just get back all my real estate stuff going. I'll buy, I'll buy the properties instead of broker the properties, and that'll be my plan. Well, here I am, 27 years later, and I'm still doing new skin maintenance, right? <laughs> you kind of have this, you know, fall in love thing with new skin, right? You love the people. You love the company. You love the, the, the development that happens. You love the change that you see in people and that you see in yourself. It's just this phenomenal personal development laboratory that challenges you to the end degree, right? And it's just phenomenal to be part of it. So that was why I wrote down number three. And then you have to talk about the obstacles to achieving your goals, right? Number one, negative people. When you start in this business, all you have is your belief. It's just this attitude you have that you're excited and you want to do this business, but you've got no experience. It's like you're really vulnerable, you know? You run into well-meaning people that want to protect you from yourself. Anybody ever run into people like that? <laughs> oh, Nathan, let me tell you, I know you've been to those meetings and I know they've got you all excited, but those things don't work. <laughs> they don't work. You know, don't, don't get sucked into that. Ever, anybody ever run into that before? Okay. And it's just amazing to me that these well-meaning people have zero experience with our business. You know? None whatsoever. It's kind of like if you wanted to make a really cool restaurant and that was your, your goal and your objective, would you take all of your advice from people who failed at their restaurant businesses or had never even tried to build a restaurant? Or would you go seek out the best restaurants and find the owners and say, hey, how did you do this? You know, tell me the intricacies. How does it actually work, right? I don't understand why people listen to people that are clueless, that are absolutely ignorant about network marketing, that have never done it, know nothing about it, really. That's some superficial, like, freaked out, weird understanding. They don't even get it, okay? Listen to the people who've actually done it. Listen to the people who've been in the trenches, who've been slogging it out, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat, right? They understand what to do and how to do it and how to build a business. And so, so negative people are a problem, right? Now, if that negative person's your spouse, I don't know what to tell you about that one, okay? It's hard to get away from them, right? Hopefully you can convert them over, you know, bring them to a few meetings, help them understand a little better about what it is you gain their support and maybe even their assistance at some point, but my strategy was just next. There's a lot of people in the world, man. If I run into people that are booger eaters, I'm not gonna sit and hang around with them, okay? I'm gonna be next. I get away from you, I'm not sticking around, right? I don't need you to destroy my attitude. Ladies and gentlemen, you gotta guard your attitude like crazy. You can't let people trash your attitude or your belief, okay? In the beginning, it's all you have to hold on to because you don't have other successes yet in your business, right? So that's, that's what you have to do. I remember one time when I was about, I don't know, 12, 14 days into the business, high school friend, really good guy, we collaborated in our real estate transactions together, and I just really respected him, you know, and he's been my friend from high school, we played football together and everything. And finally I got up the nerve to call him, and I said, you know, Scott, I need to come talk to you about what I'm doing, and, I said, I am so pumped. I've never been so excited in my whole life. And he goes, what is it? I said, I'll tell you when I get there. He goes, okay, come down, you know, but this time. So I jump in my car, I drive down to Salt Lake City. I go up the elevator to the ninth floor where his office is. And I walk in and I say, I'm here to see Scott, the assistant. She knows me. She goes, okay, he's going to conference room. We'll be in in a few minutes. And I got my little new skin blue bag. I don't know if anybody's ever seen the original blue bags from new skin. Like, if you could ever buy one on eBay, you should do it, put it in a museum, okay? <laughs> so I've got this little blue bag, I've got some products in there, you know, I've got my little homemade flip chart with my goals on the front, and I go sitting in this room waiting for him, he finally is in a hurry, he comes, he goes, okay, he goes, what's up? And I said, Scott, I said, I have joined this company out of Provo called New Skin. I have never been more excited in my life. I said, the company is amazing, the products are phenomenal, give me your hand. I, I grab his hand. I've got my hand lotion with a pump. And I go, squirt, 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 like that. And all of a sudden, he just looks at me and he kind of recoils. And he pulls his hand out of my hand. And he's looking at me and he says, What's happened to you? <laughs> 
as the lotion is dripping through his fingers, <laughs> and it's going splat, splat on the glass countertop on the conference room table. He said, what's happened to you? He said, we used to do multi-million dollar real estate transactions. Now look at you, you're selling hand cream? <laughs> I didn't know what to do. I was like two weeks young in this business. I, I didn't even have the words in my mouth to say. And I just thought, this is a big mistake. You know? I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't even have a tissue for you to wipe your hands off. <laughs> but I'm out of here. I literally was so freaked out of it. It was like, I'm asking myself, what am I doing? What am I doing? You know? And I grabbed my products, I zipped up my blue bag, I went out of there. I just said, I'm sorry, it's a mistake. I'll talk to you later. I walked out. I went down the elevator. I walked into my car in the parking structure. I'm just fuming. I'm so mad at myself that I didn't have any response to that. I remember I opened the door to my car and I took the bag and I threw the bag as hard as I could across the car. It smashes into the passenger side door, lands on the floor, and I slammed the door and I'm just sitting there dripping the steering wheel. My knuckles are white, you know, I'm like, why didn't you say something? You should have said something, you know? And I just sat there and I thought, maybe I shouldn't do this. Maybe I'm not cut out for this. You know, maybe this all was a, a big mistake. And I remember I pulled out of the parking structure and I had this little audio tape from a guy named Mark Yarnell and I plugged it in my player and I started listening. And he was talking about the dream of Museum. And I said, that is why I'm doing this business. It's not about the hand cream. It's not about squirting somebody, okay? <laughs> it's about freedom. That's why I'm doing this. Okay, it's about freedom. It's just about consumptive products in a large network that create volume, that create freedom, okay? And you know, since that time, you know, I've actually talked to him about that experience, you know? And he felt bad, he actually heard the story that I'm telling right now on YouTube or something, and he goes, hey, because I, I didn't need to like crush your brain, man. <laughs> most people, most people don't, right? He's such an awful person, actually. Still not in our business. He said, man, I probably should have done it. So, well, it's not too late, you know? You can do it now. So anyway, I just thought, you know, I'll just avoid people like that. I'll guard my attitude. I'll restate, reinforce my goals. That's going to keep me moving forward. Keep my focus on the big picture, what I'm trying to accomplish. The next one, lack of focus. I could be distracted. Now, by definition, every one of you are in this room because you're an entrepreneur. There was something about this business that tickled your entrepreneurial, you know, curiosity. And you decided there was something here that you should be involved with or look at. And it's probably because you do look at things. You're probably a little more open-minded than the average person. And so you find yourself here today. Because we're entrepreneurs, we're all born with entrepreneurial antenna. You probably never noticed these before when you look in the mirror, but they're right here. <laughs> they're right here on your head. And they're always kind of interested in the new thing, okay? And what happens is we join New Skin and we try to get focused and stay focused, you know, and after a week or two, we're out there recruiting, we're talking to people and somebody says, hey, look over here, check this out. And we go, what? What's that? Really? Oh, wow. Okay? We go, oh, no, 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 get back on track. Get back on track. A couple weeks later, hey, look over here. Oh, yeah. Wow, that's really cool. Oh, get back there. Okay? That's the problem. These things are always just kind of on a swivel, you know? They're just kind of like not completely focused because that's their job. You're an entrepreneur, right? So what you have to do, you know, when you join New Skin is you have to retract your antenna. Here's what you have to do. Everybody, just go. <laughs> and then take two screws and screw them into your head. <laughs> just lock them down. In two weeks from now, somebody's going to go, hey! And you're going to go, <laughs> and you can't do it because you're focused, right? That's the key, you guys. You've got to stay focused on your business, right? Like, diffracted. Like, if you take light 
and you take light and put it into a laser, you focus it like a laser beam, okay? Light can cut through steel. I can cut through steel with this focus, right? I mean, that's the way you have to be so that you just cut through the chaff. You get to the heart of it. You don't waste time with people that say they want to do it, but they don't really do it, right? That's the biggest problem most of us have is we waste time with people that aren't going to do it. You know, we have this false hope that we need to hang on to them somehow, right? And we're kidding ourselves. We're wasting valuable time. We've got to move on sometimes, right? So stay focused. And then number three was I would quit. I would maybe just like do something stupid and quit, right? But my answer was never quit. Never, ever, ever quit, right? You have to be a finisher. You know, most people in this world don't know how to finish. It's easy to start anything. It's hard to finish, okay? You want to set a great example for your children, your grandchildren? Be a finisher. Don't be a quitter. You quit things, that shows them that they can quit things too, okay? So what you do when you make a commitment, you're careful about the commitments you make, but when you make a commitment, you finish it all the way to the end. Okay? So that's what you do. So don't quit. Never quit. Learn to finish. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we always quit things. If when they get hard, we walk away. We never learn the personal lessons we need to learn in our lives because we just keep walking away from those lessons when we finally get confronted with them, right? And it's the same in our relationships with our spouses, children, you know, people we interact with on our teams. You know, we have to have direct conversations. We have to be open. We have to face those things and work through them. I, I'm plenty screwed up. I've got a lot of things i got to work through too, right? But we have to just keep pressing forward and keep doing doing better. Let's talk about the, uh, the obstacles, okay? So these are the things that everybody will face. Every one of us in this room We'll find out that you know these are the three main things. So number one is yourself, right? My good friend Lon Wardrop would always say there's only one person you really have to recruit. That's yourself, right? How many of you have kind of this debate every day? You've got your dream stealer person on this shoulder, you've got your positive new skin self on this shoulder, and all day long you're like, yeah. You should do this. This is like the greatest thing ever. Read your goals. Be focused. Talk to people. And over here, oh, this is really tough. That person was really rude. I don't know. This is ever going to work. <laughs> do you sit there and find yourself going between these two people all day? Have you never really made up your mind that this is it? That you're fully committed? That you're going to do this no matter what? You know what? Stop torturing yourself. I mean, you spend so much energy going back and forth. Just make a decision, okay? Just decide this is it. There's no going back. You're not going to quit. You're just going to go forward, right? You're going to get better. You're going to figure out how to make it work. That's the way you need to do it, for sure. Do you guys have the hokey pokey over here? Yeah, you know what that is, right? You got one foot in, you got one foot out. You got one foot in and then you shake it all around. <laughs> you do the hokey pokey and you turn yourself around. That's what it's that all about. Right? Is that it? <laughs> That's the problem with most of you in this room. You're doing the hokey pokey. You got one foot in, then one foot out, right? Stop it. Just jump in, both feet. Make a commitment, right? Just make sure you're going to do it no matter what. Okay. Rejection. This is just part of it, you know? You're going to get rejected, right? Has anybody here got 100% yeses? No. You know, you are going to face rejection. And frankly, it doesn't have a lot to do with you or with new skin or with anything like that. It just doesn't, okay? Getting all worked up. <laughs> so it has to do with where people are at personally. Okay, now, a lot of you have heard me talk about people being someplace on the clock, right? I'm convinced that people are ready, they're open to hear about something new when both hands are straight up at 12 o'clock. 
But our problem is most people, we find them at 3 o'clock or 6 o'clock or 9 o'clock. You know, they're just not, they're not quite at 12 o'clock where they're really ready. So you approach people and you talk to them and they just, they don't see it. They don't get it. And sometimes we think, well, was it me? You know, was it the words that I used or didn't use? And certainly, you know, words are important. Probably the tone of your words are more important than the words themselves. Okay, but it's not like you have to be perfect or spend 22 days practicing this line that you're going to talk to somebody with. Okay, it's not about that. It's about talking to enough people that you find the ones that are at 12 o'clock, that they're ready to actually hear it. And you can't take all this other stuff personal if they're at 1 or 2 or 3 or 5 or 10 o'clock because they're just not there yet. They're not open yet. Okay, I'm looking for people that have been beat up enough they're finally at a place where they're open. They're finally ready to look for something. They're finally sick and tired of being sick and tired. Right? And they're ready. They're ready for change. They're looking for an opportunity. That is when we have to find people. Now the problem is, all these people out there walking around, they don't have clocks on their forehead. So we can't look at them and go, oh, that one's 12 o'clock. I want to talk to that one, right? The only way we find this out is we have to talk to them. We have to approach them. And that's why you have to talk to lots of people to find the ones that are ready. When you find people that are at 12 o'clock, you can't say the wrong thing to the right person. This doesn't almost hardly matter what you say. It's like you can say almost anything about this. You think, okay, I'm interested. Let's see, what is it? Okay? Then you find people where you've practiced, you know, you've done your presentation, and you know, you've just got it wired. And you sit down with somebody, you give them the best one you've ever done. And they just give you this blank stare like, I don't get it. No, I don't see it. You know? You're a bit incredulous. Like, what are you talking about? That's the best presentation I've ever done. <laughs> and you didn't get that? What's wrong with you? Are you mentally retarded? What's your problem? <laughs> right? They're not at 12 o'clock. They can't see it. It's nothing to do with you. Okay? It's about where these people are at. And so that's the key. Our problem we have is that we'll go out and we'll start recruiting, and because we have fear, fear is what stops us from talking to people, right? Because we're afraid, we experience fear, it limits the number of contacts that we do. And so we'll talk to a certain amount until we kind of think, well, I've got enough. You know, I've got five, or I've got seven, or whatever, I've got ten people. And then we just start to focus on those people alone, right? And we just kind of think, well, now it's your turn to bring people, you know? And we stop recruiting people ourselves. We just kind of go into management mode, and we start, work, like, pounding on these people. Well, the fact is, a lot of these people are not going to really do it, you know? They think they want to. They may join, and then they get distracted, right? They can't stay focused, Okay. And so they're probably not going to do it. And they stop calling you back or you leave messages. They don't return them, you know. They're not exchanging with you. And all of a sudden, you're like, I'm losing them. And you get more desperate. So you try to hold on to them tighter. I feel like I'm losing you. What's going on with you? I know. Are you losing your interest in new skin? You know? Well, of course they are. That's what they're supposed to do. They're not focused, okay? And so we just sit there. In essence, we beat on people. Like, come on. Nathan Rex is coming to town. Don't you know you need to be in the room? <laughs> we sit there and we just we pound on these people that don't want to do it anymore. We're dragging dead bodies around. <laughs> it's exhausting, isn't it? Does anybody know what it means to drag dead bodies? You think they're alive, but they're not really alive. <laughs> right? But you bought five tickets for the meeting, so you got them by the hands. You're dragging them in the room. You rub all the hair off the back of their head. And you flop them up into their chair. And they're sitting there, half dead. And then you bring me over and say, Nathan, meet my team. I look at your whole team. <laughs> wow, great job. I see you're dragging dead bodies. <laughs> It's exhausting, isn't it? 
I call them energy vampires. <laughs> they just like stick their fangs in your neck. <laughs> just suck all the life out of you. You're like, come on, you can do it. I know you can. You got money, Jimmy. Come on. You spend all your time pumping them up, right? You hang up the phone and you're just like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> right? Let them go. Let them go. There's millions of people that are at 12 o'clock. They're walking right behind you. They're over here going, hey, Christian, look at me. I'm at 12 o'clock, man. I'm right here. Christian's like, don't bother me. I'm beating this person up. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. Right? So stop bragging, people. Only work with people that always call you back, that have energy, that are recruiting and talking to new people. Don't try to convince anybody, okay? Only work with people that are 12 o'clock and ready to roll, okay? You can't waste your time. If you're not getting a response back from people, you can't, you can't invest your time. Time is your enemy. Time is going to make you expire in this business unless you have success. And so you have to hurry. You're in a race against time. Okay, you want to move quickly, don't waste time. And that means, a lot of times, that means letting go of people, like maybe before you think it's time. Okay, so that's what you have to do. Okay, let's see, we did rejection, discouragement. Okay, what's that one? Well, this is where people are at 12 o'clock, they're psyched, they join, okay? They even retract their antenna for a little while. They become executives, maybe even gold or lapises, right? And then all of a sudden something happens, and typically it's nothing to do with new skin. Sometimes it's relationship problems, something happens, parents, children, job, something, right? And they actually get really distracted, and they quit. And you go like, really? How could you quit? Well, this is a bummer for you, because you know maybe you're a lapis, and you recruited these two people, they've become executives, you're so excited, two more, and you're gonna go to uh, Cape Town or something, right? And you're just like on, you're like, you're, you're on, the, on the plan here. And then one of them quits. And it's a real bummer, right? You go like, back to gold? Oh, that's painful, right? So then you like pump up and you go recruit, you find another one, get back to lapis, okay? And then you try to hold it, make sure these two people are solid, and you think, I gotta get to Cape Town. So you recruit two more, and you become a ruby. You actually made it, okay? So now you're going to be qualified instead of maintain, right? You actually maintain and you get on your trip to Cape Town. But on your way, one of them quits. So you actually show up in Cape Town as a lapis. <laughs> <laughs> Shh. <laughs> Just know that a lot of people go on their ruby trip as a lapis. <laughs> it's not just you, okay? It's the business, guys. It's two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, one step back. Sometimes two step forward, then two step back, right? And so you come home and you're like, I'm gonna be a ruby, but I can't live a lie. I gotta get back to ruby, okay? <laughs> and so you go recruit and you get back to ruby, right? You hold them, hold them, hold them, okay. They're solid. Then you go get the two more. Become an emerald, right? Me. Back to Ruby. Mm, boom. Back to Lapis. Hold it, folks. This is top, right? Back to Ruby. Fight, fight, fight. Back to Emerald. Okay? Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Go to diamond. Okay? Big diamond. Alright. Big diamond. Back to that. Okay? Back to diamond. Hold it up. Back to emerald. Back to Ruby! Dang it! Back to Emerald. Back to Diamond. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Okay, now it's the big one. Now it's four, right? This one is a hard one because it's like four. Blue Diamond! Try to hold it. No way. Back to Blue Diamond. <laughs> yeah. Back to Blue Diamond. Back to Diamond. Dang it, I hate this Blue Diamond thing. Back to Blue Diamond. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Big jump to 
Team Lincoln, right? Team Lincoln. I was just about a minute. <laughs> Team Elite, maybe I'll make the trip this year. Maybe, okay, going to Team Elite trip as a lead diamond. Yeah, back to Team Elite. Eventually, Team Elite. Eventually, business builder Team Elite. Lots of money. Okay. That's the business. Right? a little bit, haven't we? Oh yeah, we're actually out of time. So we're, we've already covered this. You gotta just keep talking to people. Now, worst case, people have always asked me, just give me the bottom line, right? So I'm a business guy and I'm like, okay, I know the numbers. If you are willing to talk to 2,000 people, yourself, not all your downlines people, but you, yourself, I don't know how you're not with team elite. I mean, if you're just awake and listening and getting feedback and improving and getting better and overcoming your fear and talking to better and better people. I, I don't know how you're not a I mean, just going through the process, you're going to improve, right? And the closer you do this, like if you're doing it consistently every day, why is it important to do New Skin every day? Why do we not just do New Skin once a week on Saturday and that's the only day we work our New Skin business? Because you don't have feedback close enough when you're recruiting and you're not successful or you can't answer an objection somebody has or you're not sure how to make it work, right? You don't get the feedback close enough together that you can change and improve and become more effective. The closer the feedback is together, the faster your rate of improvement is. Does that make sense? That's why you've got to do it a little bit every day. Even if you've got another job, you've got to talk to people every day. And everybody can do it. You make it your priority. It fits in the corners of your, of your day and you make it happen, okay? We talked about this, I think, as well. Building, biting, blaming, and bankrupt. Those are the four phases of the business. If you don't stay in phase number one, you're on your way out of this business. You just are. I mean, why do you think we have no cross-lining and respecting sidelines in our, uh, in our, our uh, system seven you know, principles? I mean, why is that part of being a team, a team player? You know, respecting sidelines, no cross lining. Do you know why? Because at any given time, about one third of the people are coming in, about one third of the people are building leadership, and about one third are leading the business. They're on their way out. It's just the way it is, guys. And that's why we have that protective principle in place, right? And that's because they don't stay in phase number one. You have to always stay in phase number one. How many of you here actually work in the advertising department in this game? Anybody here work in customer service? Anybody here work in the legal department? County department? The shipping department? The warehouse? Anybody here? Oh, I didn't think so. Anybody think you're a scientist? Some of you think you are. <laughs> yeah. You talk way too much about the products, okay, the science. Okay? Yeah, I didn't see any hands go up. So none of you have to do any of those regular corporate functions, do you? There's only one thing you have to do. Don't ever forget it. Open your mouth and talk to people. That's it, okay? Ask them questions. You know, start a conversation with people. Get good at getting into conversation. Maybe you recruit them, maybe you won't. We don't know, okay? We don't know. So what you do is you just get good at getting into conversations. Okay? You ask people questions. You say, so what do you do? You know, how's it going? You know, are you enjoying it? Did you ever think you'd be where you're at at this point in your career? Okay? Are you making the kind of progress that you'd hope to make? What is your plan over the next five years? You know, what are your dreams? What do you want to accomplish in your life? I mean, there's so many questions you can ask people, just like that, right? And when you ask a question, then what do you do? Shut your mouth. <laughs> Shut up, okay? Listen, oh, theaters. Ask a question, listen. Ask a question, listen. Too many people just want to like, just, you know, throw up on people. I know so much about age law. Let me tell you about genetics. Okay? Stop it. Just talk to people. Have a conversation with people, okay? Stay in phase number one so you don't end up bankrupt in your new skin business, okay? We've done that. This is my favorite quote, okay? 
my favorite quote in the whole world, actually. Um, it goes like this, right? The greatest loss in life is the potential, excuse me, the greatest loss in life is the difference between human potential versus actual performance. Now, nobody really knows who the author is of that quote, but it's a great quote. It makes us stop and ask ourselves this question, okay? What is my potential? What do you think your potential is? I mean, psychologists tell us that we use about 10% of our brain capacity. You know, about 10%. What if you could use 20%? You know, what if you could use more than that? I mean, it would be phenomenal, right? I mean, I'm kind of glad that I played American football. I've only got about half my brain left. So at least 10% is working, happening, right? How much more can you accomplish in your life? If you don't have those goals written down, then you're like this ship without a rudder. You're being blown about by the wind and the waves. You bump into whatever port you happen to bump into. You're without an objective, without a real destination. You know, people waste huge amounts of their life just floating around, like not knowing what they're doing and where they're going, you know? Decide, make a decision and go for it. Do it. You know, make it happen. Along the way, you'll learn all these things. Okay, what if you don't ever end up becoming a Blue Diamond or Team Elite? I guarantee you, you will learn so much about yourself that will make you more successful in everything else you're doing in your life because of the principles you can pick up right here. So the greatest loss in life is the difference between human potential versus actual performance. Okay, so I just want to tell you what, what my beliefs are, okay? These are just my beliefs, okay? This is not... New skin, this is just Nathan, Nathan speaking here. So here's how I look at this thing, okay? I believe that every person in this room is a child of God. So if God is your father and you inherited his characteristics, what is your potential? It's unlimited. Unlimited. Every person in this room can do so much more, be so much better, influence so many more people in our lives, right? For good. I mean, we really can. And I think it just takes us raising the bar, you know, thinking in a bigger way with a bigger picture about what's our purpose. Ultimately, what should we be doing to help people, influence people, right? Guiding people. And this business, folks, it's not the end of all things, right? For me, I've said this a couple of times already, this is a means to an end, right? It creates a lifestyle so I can do the things that I really need to do in my life, right? And that's the beauty of what, what happens when we are able to build a new skin business. Okay. This is the process of change, actual change, okay? Have any of you ever read a book called As a Man Thinketh by James Allen? Anybody read that? The leaders on the front row look like they've read it. Okay, a couple back here. Very good. Okay. I highly recommend this book. It is a teeny little book. You can read it in an hour, probably less, okay? James Allen was one of the first authors in this century or last century that started talking about personal development, about how you can change who you are, how you can change your future. He was the first one who said that if you change your thoughts, you can change your future. Right? Human beings are the only form of life on this planet that can actually reason. We can actually create the future in our minds before it exists in reality, right? Every building in this city was probably created on a piece of paper out of somebody's mind before it was physically constructed, right? We can do the same thing with our future and our lives, all right? We can architect our lives so that we have a plan. We know where we're going instead of being a firefighter and constantly running from one fire, one explosion to the next and trying to put it out. That's how a lot of people live their lives. And a lot of people inflict their own fires upon themselves because they're stupid, okay? Stop being stupid, you know, make better choices, you know, do things that make sense, not dumb things. And then architect your life so you have a plan that you can actually change your future. James Allen likened our minds to a garden. So your mind is like a garden. He said, be careful what you plant in the garden because that's what's going to grow in your mind, okay? So what do you do? What should you be planting in your garden? Positive things, right? Positive thoughts, 
I actually read the Bible, you know, scriptures every morning for about 30 minutes because I want to ground myself with positive truth. Walmart stores. Ridiculous. I'll think of it in a minute. Okay. I read his autobiography. Sam Walton. Gosh, there you go. So I just finished reading Sam Walton's autobiography a couple months ago. What an inspiring story of a guy that just fought against all odds and became the biggest retailer in the world, right? I mean, there's so many great books that you can read of people that have accomplished amazing things that can motivate you. I mean, I get super motivated when I read about those people that are willing to like plow through it, you know? Because every business has problems, right? Everybody knows Elon Musk, right? Y'all know Elon Musk, Tesla, right? Solar City and SpaceX. I mean, the guy's a consummate entrepreneur. I read an article about him a few, few months ago, and he said, what's it like being an entrepreneur? You know what his answer was? He said, well, being an entrepreneur is like staring into the abyss and eating glass every day. <laughs> That's what it is. Not much fun. Okay? Staring into the abyss and eating less. That's what he said. Okay? It's tough. It is tough. Everybody wants to tell you why things are not going to work. Why it's never going to happen. Right? You have to internalize. You've got to have your own compass. Your own belief about where you're headed. Now, the difference between what he's doing and what we're doing is there's people like me that have gone before you that have actually done this. And you can listen to us. And we can stand here and speak to you and try to encourage you and inspire you and give you a way of thinking about this business, right? So plant good things. Eliminate the garbage. You've heard me say this before. You will be the average of your five closest friends. The five people you hang out with the most is who you are going to become. Because we kind of just seek our own level, right? And if there are a bunch of crabs in a pot, and you decide you want to climb out of the pot and go someplace else in your life, what do the crabs do to the one who's trying to climb out? They all grab onto the person and chuck them back in the pot. Because nobody wants you to make them look bad as you change the bar, as you raise the bar and change the status quo. Because it may reflect negatively on them or their lack of motivation or where they want to go or what they want to do with their own lives, right? And so you need to examine who are you hanging out with all the time, okay? And you just got to just realize, you know, you're not going to go very far if you spend four hours a day in the pub, okay? Ain't going to happen. You got to decide, do you want to change your future or not? You know, do you want to go out and associate with people that are motivated people? You know, you're going to find a lot of those motivated people right here in this company that can lift you, that can inspire you, that can give you a bigger vision of what you're capable of in your life and in your future. So those are the things that you need to do. Okay, so thoughts are where it starts. You've got to think differently. How do you do that? You come to an event like this. You write down a few things. You get inspired, okay? You start to think a little bit differently about this business and what the possibilities are. You write down your goals. You read them every day and you change your subconscious mind. You program it. That subconscious mind is so powerful that it never sleeps. It's always working on solving the goals you give it all the time. It's coming up with answers, okay? But you have to feed the positive information in. If you're spending your time looking at porn, you're spending your time reading garbage, <laughs> you're spending your time doing all this stuff, guess what? You ain't going to have the answers when your brain goes to look for them, okay? You've got to spend your time putting great stuff in your head all the time, okay? You have to. Otherwise, it ain't going to happen for you. All right, so that's number one. Thoughts lead to words. When you are thinking these things, you will eventually verbalize them. You will tell people where you're going. You'll inspire people. You'll speak differently, okay? Words spoken will lead to actions. You think them, you verbalize them, you act on them. That's what happens, okay? So actions, you have to take action on a daily basis. Actions repeated over and over again become habits in our lives, right? 21 days, doing something consistently, 21 days, you just created a new habit in your life. And so we have two kinds of habits. Habits can be the best of servants or they can be the worst of masters. It just depends the kind of habits that you want to form in your life. If you want to smoke and you want to let that be your addiction, and you want to be owned by your cigarettes so they are your master and you have to jump out of meetings and smoke and like get a, get a smoke outside and you, know, you got to do whatever you got to do, then that will run your life. That will be your master, okay? It's the same with any addiction. I don't care what it is, okay? On the other hand, you can form good habits, 
all right? What is a good habit that you can do that will serve you well? Be the best of servants your whole life. Reading 30 minutes a day of something positive and powerful. That can transform your whole life. It'll change the way you think. It'll plant great things in your garden. And you'll have a massive harvest, okay? Another one is move your body every day, okay? It's called mind over mattress, okay? <laughs> you have to get out of bed in the morning. If I don't do it first thing in the morning, it doesn't happen, okay? So 6 a.m., I am up and I am doing my workout. I did it this morning, even after getting here, past midnight last night from Madrid. I still got up at 6. I still went to the gym this morning. I still got my workout in. You know, it's a priority. You know, you'll do things that are your priorities, won't you? To find a way you always do what your real priority is. So you can't lie to yourself. You got to be honest with yourself and say, where am I really spending my time? Am I doing it in the things that should be my biggest priorities? Okay, so you have to figure out how to be disciplined on these things. And so you have to like do that. If you do that, this body is a miracle. This body is how you will derive all of your income pretty much will come from the efforts of this body, okay? At least initially, it'll come because you have the energy and the brain and the focus and you're willing to be consistent and do it, right? Most of your enjoyment will come with your body and your brain, okay? You gotta take care of them, you know? We're in an anti-aging business, guys. A big part of it is staying fit and staying healthy, right? And being an example to people. And so you have to make it a priority, okay? You know, these things, that's just a couple. There's tons of other things you can do that are, are positive habits, okay? Just, I'll give you one more. It's negative talk. People all the time, I hear people go, well, I shouldn't have done that, I'm so stupid. I, like, I tell my kids, don't ever say that. You are not stupid, okay? Don't self-talk yourself into too stupidity, okay? Just say something like this. When I do something like that, I go, that's not like me. I'm way better than that. I shouldn't have done that. You see the difference? Just little things like this where the way we think and change our brain. You probably think I'm insane, but when I'm home and I ride my bike up the canyon, this is a major workout. And I get up to this little place where the, the mountain stream is running under this bridge and the mist is kind of blowing over the bridge and you can just kind of sit there and get misted and cool off after you just cranked out this bike ride. And I'll go to the bridge and I'll put my bike there and I go like this. Yes! You can do anything you set your mind to. You have to look around make sure nobody's watching. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the kind of positive self-talk that you need to give yourself because a lot of times I feel like the weight that I'm carrying with my skin business around the world and a lot of the needs people have is pretty heavy sometimes. And I need to feel like I can really do anything. So I have to tell myself that I can do that, okay? So those habits, good or bad, and that's your choice, will create your character, okay? This is who you become. This is what the kind of person that you are. All of us in this room are in the process of becoming something, either to the good or to the bad. Okay? That's the fact. Nobody is standing still. There's no such thing as the status quo. You're either going forward or you're going backward in your life. Period. So, as human beings, do you know when we're happy? We're happy when we feel like we're making progress. We're wired that way. You know, we want to do better. Okay? And so that's what we have to decide that we're going to do. That is who you become, and your character fixes your destiny. This is the legacy. This is how people remember you when you're gone. Okay? Thoughts lead to words. Words lead to actions. Actions repeated form your habits. Habits create your character, and your character. <laughs> what time is it? 9.50? Is that what it is? Yep. So we got 30 minutes or so? Actually 20 or something? Okay. So, um, let's see. Why don't you guys bring up the, uh, what do we call that one? Those are our grandkids. So we're just down on the beach in California hanging out, right? Probably can't see them too good, but uh, they're a fun little crew. So we've got six, I have four daughters, no boys. They say that's all my fault. <laughs> it's okay, they're incredible. They married four good guys. So far, so good. Okay. And uh, 
So we have six grandchildren, but now three of them are pregnant this year. So we're gonna go to nine grandkids by the end of the year, all right? So I set some goals for my daughters when they were growing up. I told them I wanted 20 grandkids. <laughs> we wrote it down, we read it every day. <laughs> So it's only five each, you know. You guys can do one better than your mom and dad did, right? And so when we built our big ranch house up at our ranch in the Rocky Mountains, I built this big, huge room above the garage, and it's got 20 bunk beds in it. So we're all set up. I watched the movie, If You Build It, They Will Come. So it's all done, right? We're just waiting for them to show up. So we're rooting for them, right? So anyway, it's just such a blast. I mean, it's just so much fun hanging out with these grandkids and having fun, right? Not that it's not a lot of work sometimes, but that's okay. I mean, that's the legacy of life that I want to leave, right? Right there. So, just a blast. Okay, there's those guys. Okay. <laughs> Maybe you need to control it up there. There we go. Okay, we talked about the whys. I want to talk a little bit about entry points. What I've seen in New Skin is that not all time is created equal. There are certain times when certain things happen that your business, you're gonna get a lot more results in certain time frames than you do in others with the same amount of work. So like right now, the UK is going through fantastic growth, right? Congratulations to everybody here. This is amazing what you guys are doing. If you ask, yeah. yeah. However, if you were to go back four years ago and ask the leaders that were here, you know, how fast is it growing? They would have told you that now, this time is a lot better than that time, okay? So you need to make hay while the sun shines, right? You guys are off to the races now, so now you just keep this thing growing and going, and you multiply it 10, 15, 20, 50 times, okay? There is a lot of runway that's available right here for you to do it, and you guys will spill out of here throughout Europe. You'll spill into the Americas. You'll spill all over the world with your teams, which is really exciting, okay? You will start in the next five years, I'll make a prediction. There'll be a lot of people in this room that will have more business outside of the UK than you will have in the UK within five years. And you don't even know who those people are yet. That's exciting, isn't it? That's gonna happen for a lot of you, okay? So what I've seen are that there's these entry points where, man, if you can time the entry point, you know, you come in right when something really booms, then you just feel like it was magic. It's maybe a little deceptive because you don't realize that it can be tougher than that at certain points, but boy, what a great ride when you just plug in and go for it, right? So I've seen this happen with country opens. We've opened 54 countries now. And really, without exception, every time we do this, the people that are positioned, they're ready to work, they've built leadership in advance, they're ready to open the market. These people, they own these countries, you know? And they end up just creating long-term streams of money, and it's happened every time. Like, no exceptions, okay? So it's like such a given that now when we're opening new countries, people will go to those countries and they'll start doing like Herbalife or Amway or something just to practice waiting for the real network marketing company, NewSkin, to show up, right? And as soon as NewSkin shows up, they'll just swing their people over to NewSkin and they're finally home where they really want to be, right? So it's really interesting how that can happen. New product launches, sometimes you'll have such a powerful product that will launch, like we just launched you, Page Lock you. We did 23 million in eight minutes in America, okay? It is a phenomenal product. I mean, it's a really incredible product. So you guys will have that someday. I don't know when, but someday you'll actually have that launch here as well. And that attracts like a whole new kind of people, right? A whole new section of the population that maybe was not interested, but all of a sudden they understand what that product can do and it attracts them. And so you have another period of growth. And then the same thing right here, this new category builders. So for example, when we launched the biophotonic scanner in 2003 in this company, and now we've had three iterations, the S1, the S2, the S3 scanner, okay? That completely changed nutrition. All of a sudden, other companies were bringing their customers to try to have us test them and see if their products actually worked or not, because we're the only guys who have the machine that can measure it, right? It's a monopoly. And we've now scanned 22 million people globally because of the biophotonic scanner. Now, it's not a business that probably a lot of you are focused on right now, but it was a huge movement in this company when all of a sudden we launched it. And it continues to have tremendous results because youth produces really high scan scores. 
Okay, so people can validate youth with the scanner. You're seeing the scanner just exploding in all across the Americas, okay? So these are all very unique things. Some stories are really strong stories. I think probably the strongest story we ever had as far as a product story was the biophotonic scanner. I mean, I alone, just in the new downlines that I was able to build because of that device, I made more than 10 million in commissions just from that one launch, okay? So that's what can happen if you find these category builders. Age Lock Me, in my opinion, is the best story we've ever had, okay? It is definitely a category builder, for sure. So I'm just gonna show you a couple of my thoughts on this so you can see what it is. Okay, in America, we talk about Keurig. We can easily just substitute Keurig for Nespresso, okay? So just play like this as Nespresso in Europe. Okay? In Europe, Nespresso owns this home brew, office brew, single serving, customized coffee market. And you're talking about billions of portions served a year. Billions, okay? You're talking somewhere on the order of 100 million custom brew Nespresso machines around the world, okay? Over 50 million Keurig machines around the world that brew a custom cup of coffee. These guys stepped into a market where people were drinking a lot of coffee. I don't know if anybody remembers the traditional coffee pops that people used to have in offices and houses all over the world. And if you wanted a cup of coffee, you had to brew a whole pot. And half the time, half the pot went to waste. It got old, you dump it out, clean it, was gone, right? These guys just said, hey, we can actually make it more efficient. We can give people on-demand coffee. We can give them exactly the kind of coffee they want. They're going to drink the pot of what else is going to okay? And we're going to change the coffee market. And they did. Last year, Keurig alone sold over 10 million brewers just in the Americas. Okay? I don't know how many espresso sold in Europe last year, but millions, millions. Okay? So you have to kind of stop and think about it. I've not done all the math for Europe, but I did some math for the US, and you guys are going to kind of see what it is. This was two years ago. Two years ago, they sold over 30 billion servings of coffee. 30 billion of the consumable cartridges that go in the coffee machine, okay? The average consumption is about $30 a month for every one of those machines. Man, if you could be like the person who put that machine in people's houses and they paid you on those cups that people were drinking every month, would that be a good business? How many of you got invited to distribute espresso machines through Europe? Nobody got invited? Oh, really? Okay. All right, good. Okay? Curry just got bought for 14 billion. That's how good that idea was. Okay? They founded the idea, they started it, just sold their company for 14 billion. Okay? Pretty serious. How many people have an inkjet printer in your house or in your office? Almost every hand. You know, they basically sell the printer at cost so they can get you hooked on those cartridges of ink, right? Hewlett Packard is the number one provider in the world of home printers and office printers that use ink and cartridges. Are you aware that 40% of Hewlett Packard's profit annually is ink? It comes from ink. Not all their big scientific equipment and their huge computers and all that stuff. It comes from the lowly ink cartridge, okay? It is a phenomenal business for Hewlett Packard. Now, how many of you were invited by Hewlett Packard to distribute their printers so you could paint on the ink for the rest of your life? Nobody? Yeah, they just went out and did it through stores and they kept all that money for themselves, right? Don't you detest buying your ink cartridges? <laughs> it's just ridiculous, isn't it? But you do it. Anyway, okay? So this model is a really powerful model, okay? We're seeing the same thing now as I just mentioned because the biophotonic scanners the machine and it drives the consumption of these products. And we're seeing this huge explosion with age lock youth because of the scanner, it's happening all over the Americas and Asia right now, okay? So it's the Gillette model. What is the Gillette model? They'll sell the razor at cost, so you'll buy the blades for the rest of your life, bigger you're shaving, right? Exactly, okay? It's the disposable component of it, the usable, consumptive component that is the real business, right? That's the real business, okay? The devices, are just the means to create the monthly consumption. So NewScan went out six years ago and they conducted a survey. 
They surveyed over 6,000 people, customers of Michigan products worldwide in all countries where Michigan does business. They gathered all this data from this survey and they brought it back to the home office in Utah and they started analyzing the data. Guess what they learned? As they asked all these people, these customers, about them, their skin, their humidity, their pore size, wrinkles, texture, dry, oily, all this stuff, age, sun exposure, you know, chemical exposure, stress, all these things, right? This whole survey, they analyze these data and they realize we need to make 300 skincare products. If we're going to meet the needs of every person that we see that are our customer base, we've got to have 300 SKUs in all the warehouses so that we can give them what they really need. And all of a sudden, they realize we can't do it. There's no way we can stock 300 SKUs in all these warehouses, right? And that's where the idea came from for Age Like Me. They started asking the question, how can we deliver that many types of product? How can we customize product to that degree, right? And that's where Age Like Me was born from. They, they hired one of the top industrial design firms in the world here in London. And we worked with them for the last six years. And New Skin invested more than $35 million. Tons of customer focus groups, tons of technology, all these things they've done to create the most amazing products, okay, that, that I think I've ever seen in my career. And here's what's so great about this. It is so duplicable. What does that mean? Duplicatable? Duplicable? I'm not sure which word you want to use to mean the same thing. Because you don't have to talk about science. All we do is we just take that device, we pop the top open, and we say to people, what does that look like? And they say, that looks like the cartridges in my inkjet printer. And you say, exactly. Exactly right. Did anybody invite you to distribute inkjet printers so you could pay on those cartridges? No? I didn't think so. This company is going to deploy millions of these devices in people's bathrooms. And you have the ability right now to get paid on those cartridges and that consumption for the rest of your life. That's it. That's the deal, okay? Why am I excited about it? Because it's a twice a day habit, okay? We sold over four million galvanic spas so far. Four million galvanic spas. Do you know what galvanic spas reorder rate is? 30%. 30% of all those spas reorder the actual gels and keep using those spas. Most of them go in a drawer. Why? Because they're not a daily use product. If you have a daily use product, you form a habit. Exactly, okay? That's why twice a day use is a big deal. And the early compliance numbers that we're seeing are two times plus what we see with galvanic devices, okay? So it's a big deal, you guys, right? It's an amazing product. So they will continue to expand the line of cartridges. You know, there's so many line extensions we can do off of this product. We can have a men's line of cartridges, multiple cartridges for men. We can have an acne line of cartridges. We can have ethnic lines of cartridges. We can do all these different things, right, that we'll, we'll see in the future. This is the first iteration. Okay, there'll be an age lock me too and a me three, okay, over the next four or five years as they continue to improve this device. All right, so this is exciting times, and the exciting times are we're the first ones. We got first mover advantage here. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have an espresso in your house? Raise your hands if you got an espresso. Okay, got one, quite a few. Let's say curry comes from America, and they come knock on your door, and they say, hey, we know you've already got an espresso, but we've got this curry machine. We'd like to replace your espresso with our curry. How much harder is it for them to knock your espresso out of your kitchen if you're already used to it, you know how to operate it, you've already got a whole stack of the cartridges, the cups, right? Is it tough for a new competitor to come in and displace an already installed machine in your house? Yeah. That's way harder than if you just get there first, okay? So that's what we're doing now. We're just gonna get there first. There will be copycats. Right now, we already know that every major skincare company is trying to figure out how to make one of these machines. They're already on it. Truman Hunt, our CEO, told me about three days ago that they got a report back that the president of Shiseido in Japan had had his engineers dismantle an age like me device and look at all of the components and they determined that the patents were too strong for them to try to copy us. So they decided to shelve it for right now, okay? But the Japanese are cautious. They're more cautious than most. So that's not really good news. 
because the, the CEO of L'Oreal has already had his engineers tear apart Age Lock Main and look at it. And we heard that he stand, stood in front of his room of his engineering department and he said, really? He held up Age Lock Main. He said, really? Provo, Utah? Really? Provo did this? And you guys couldn't come up with this? The guy was tech, you know? They're gunning for us. They're coming, you guys, because they have to. They cannot just sit back and not come after this market. We just changed the whole game. I hate to say it, but bottles are dead. Bottles are dead now, okay? It's all gonna go to these customized, on-demand, 3D printed skincare machines. That's where it's gonna go. So they're gonna be in people's bathrooms all over the world, right? And our job is that we're first. I mean, all of us in this room, we will never find ourselves in this place again. We will never find ourselves in a place where we're the first mover in what is an absolutely enormous market like this, where we can do what we can do with this product, okay? Do you realize that if you build a team that distributes 1,000 of these products, these age like these into bathrooms out there, 1,000 of them, that you will make $100,000 a year just on the reorders? Do you understand that? Do you understand if you build a team that distributes 10,000 age like me devices that you can make basically a million dollars a year the rest of your life? Do you understand that? It's going to happen one time. It's going to be the next four or five years, and then the market's going to get pounded as people figure out how to try to work around our patents and come up with their own devices. Trust me, it's going to happen, okay? We have to get there first. We want to get there first, and we want to own this market and make sure that we capture it. I don't know if you're aware of the micro layering. Everybody up to, up to speed on this? This is really cool stuff. You know about 3D printing, right? There's a company here in England that is 3D printing houses. They got this huge 3D printer half the size of this room and they print your house. Just put it on your wall. Okay? People can print guns from the internet. They can 3D print a gun that will fire. You can print your buttons. You can print your dinner plates. If you want a new color of dinner plates, and you can print them and put them out on your table, okay? Right now, most people don't know about 3D printing. In 10 years, you will all know about 3D printing. You might have a 3D printer in your house in 10 years, okay? We're one of the first companies in the world to use a practical application of 3D printing to customize and print your skincare on demand in your bathroom, okay? That is a pretty cool thing alone that we're able to do that. And so it's a very sophisticated printer. And it lays down 40 different layers. And each little dog that gets printed out of that age like me device, if you were to analyze it with a microscope, you'd see 40 different layers, 40 different slices, okay? And that's important because when you actually put that on your skin and you apply it to your face, it actually goes on in the right proportions mixed properly. And they have done the study on this now, and they know you get three times more absorption three times more effectiveness of these ingredients than if you simply squeeze them into a little dish and you stir them with your finger and then try to put them on your face. Same ingredients, just printed instead of stirred with your finger, okay? So the printing component of it is actually a really important piece of the results people get. And everybody says <coughs> the quality of this product is beyond anything they've ever used before in their life. And so it's a really great product. Some pictures from our friends in Korea that have been doing this for three months. I know the lighting's pretty horrible, but huge changes in this lady's overall, just her face in general, right? And so we, we see those things. Okay, so first mover advantage, you know, almost $40 million invested. Very few people in our industry could ever compete. It will be the traditional industry of skincare that competes. Four patents with 27 independent claims. Those claims are important. That stops our competitors. 2,000 unique customized formulas, right? Hygienic, hands-free delivery at the moment of use. There are certain ingredients that formulary scientists can't even consider mixing in the same jar because they fight each other and they will actually neutralize one or the other and maybe even spoil the product. And so there's some things that can be used. Well, now because we have these five cartridges that are hermetically sealed, so we have the ability to hold these things separate until the actual printing, now you can consider all kinds of ingredients that no one's ever been able to use before, including new skin, in jars, okay? So it's a powerful thing. 
So there you go. We got the mixture. Micro layering, we talked about that. I think, so I don't know why this thing, there we go. And three times the absorption because of that 3D printing. So those are the advantages. Okay, can you bring up the last, uh, that third PowerPoint, please? That show up in bottles and jars of skincare. Okay? And because of this, every company uses preservatives, antibacterial, and antimicrobial agents in their skincare products. Because as soon as you expose it to air or water or dip your finger in it, you just contaminate it. Okay? And so if you don't have these agents, then you kind of throw a petri dish in your bathroom. Not healthy. Not good, right? And so that's the problem. So these, these affect the look, the color, and smell of skincare products. So that's just a little bit of bacteria picture from a person's bottle of skincare, okay? That's what it looks like when it starts to grow a certain kind of mold, okay? I think uh, there's another one. Hard to see, but right in the middle. There's two spots, okay? There's another one. This is kombucha mold. It grows inside skincare products, okay? It's not a, it's not a fun thing. Oh, I already showed you that one. Am I going the right way? Hello? Come on. That's actually part of a person's skin when they put some product on. These things can happen if you have bacteria, mold, yeast in your skincare products. That can happen to your skin, right? Okay, so does everybody now understand why they have to go to a 3D printed skincare product? Do you understand that the world just changed? This is kind of like a story nobody wants to tell anybody in the world of skincare, okay? I don't think people are gonna use bottles and jars anymore once the story's out. I think they're all gonna go to h block main devices, okay? What do you think? Yeah, kind of sobering, isn't it? So those are the sources of contamination, right? And that's what promotes the growth. So when you have a device, I mean, I don't think Lucian understood that when they invented this, what they were really doing. But what they really are doing is they just changed the whole game. The whole game is completely changed worldwide. Why do you think the CEOs of these companies are freaking out? Really, because it's game over. You know, they don't want to give us the whole $150 billion skincare market, do they? They have to respond to this, okay? We are in the most unbelievable position. I mean, we're literally right there. We own all the patents. We have the only working 3D printed skincare device in the world. We need to go out and own the bathrooms of the world right now so nobody comes in and tries to displace us, right? And your skin will stay on this. You know, they'll get better and better and better at doing this. They'll make better and better devices. Someday it'll all be internet connected, you know? They'll know every time people use their skincare, okay? So it'll be, it'll be it'll better and better and better over time. Okay, I think we're all done. Let's take a 15 minute break. Is that what we're doing? Okay, 15 minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.